Okay, well, let's get this started. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining. My name is uh, George Bailey, and I am, in fact, the Executive Director of the Digital Supply Chain Institute and also the Chief Research Officer. And uh, I'm going to say a few things about who we are before we get, uh, before we get started. It's always important to know the point of view and the perspective of the people with whom you're dealing. So the Digital Supply Chain Institute, uh, DSCI, is a not-for-profit, and we're focused on developing ways and methods to improve the performance of the supply chain going forward. In other words, what should the supply chain of the future look like? What should it be uh, comprised of? And how should we start right now to, to move forward with it? So that's our mission. Uh, we're headquartered in New York City, but in fact, we have a global membership and we have people and meetings all around the world. Uh, the last one we had was in Belgrade, uh, the other one in Dallas. We, ha we have them literally around the world. We had one in Santiago. So it's uh, Hong Kong, around the world. The focus is always, always about how can global supply chains get better? And certainly, uh, we're going to have a lot of discussion about that today, particularly because this coronavirus has forced everyone in the world to look very carefully at their supply chains and decide what is it that we can do now to make things improve. And if you do it the right way, you'll be able to improve not only survive this, this, this crisis we're in the middle of, but also make your supply chain stronger and better and meet the needs of the new customer that's out there across the, uh, across the market. And when we do our work at the Digital Supply Chain Institute, we do it with our membership. And there's a number of members here on the, on the call today, this collaboratory. Um, but we also do it with uh, non-members with whom we, uh, we, do, we do work. And uh, there's probably almost a thousand companies around the world that we've worked with over the past few years. So it's uh, quite a broad set of companies. Uh, we do the work based on interviews and primary research, but we also do it based on actually action research. So we actually do programs for a company that helps them experiment on getting better. Uh, so one example of that is blockchain. You know, blockchain is a technology that has great promise in the supply chain area, but how do you actually use it? How do you actually make it valuable? So we've done actual real life pilots with that. We've done those pilots around things like algorithms and data driven decision making and all sorts of other things that help make. Uh, supply chains perform, uh, perform much better. Uh, we're having a series now on this whole issue of the coronavirus and how it impacts supply chains. And I think the one good thing about the coronavirus, if there is any one good thing, is that it has forced the world to really recognize the critical nature of the supply chain business process and the absolute importance it has to driving everything that happens with your customer and with your company. So people really get how important uh, the supply chain is. So we're doing a series of sessions. This is the second one we've had on this topic of what can you do about uh, your supply chain in the middle of this crisis to make it better short term and also longer term. Um, by the way, we always have companies present on this from around the world and we have speakers from around the world as well. So you'll get to see today the perspective of some leading companies in India, in Central Europe and in the US. So we'll, I'm looking forward to introducing you to these these players. If you are a member company or uh, a select company, you'll be able to participate uh, by phone by actually speaking to the participants in the call and to the, uh, the panelists. So if you are, are one of those people, please keep your phone on mute. And when it's time to uh, ask a question, please go ahead and, uh, and let me know. And of course, we welcome as much participation as we can get. Uh, if you're not uh, able to communicate via audio, you will be able to participate with uh, using your chat feature. So the chat feature and the Q&A feature are both available to you. Please use them. Uh, as we go through the presentation or as we get near the, uh, the bulk of the discussion so that we can understand what you're feeling and how things are going for you. Um, uh, I want to make sure that you know that we're not going to talk about the terrible impact the coronavirus or COVID-19 is having on people and on health. Uh, that's not our scope. It's not our expertise. We know a lot about uh, how it impacts the supply chain and companies progress. But uh, obviously the big, biggest issue is the, the toll that it's taking on people around the world. And uh, we all hope that that works out uh, just as well as it absolutely can. Um, so our, our way to add value though is about the supply chain and about how companies can behave now to make things, make things better. All right, so you can see right in front of you now the uh, objectives we have this collaboratory. Uh, we're gonna have these, as, as I mentioned, a series of these over time as we 
uh, have new topics and new presenters, and you'll always get to see people from around the world speaking about what they're doing, and you'll pick up some ideas about what you can do even better uh, in your company. So the three objectives here. Okay, number one is to outline the overall impact of the coronavirus on global supply chains. Um, and a special focus of today is going to be about the supplier link. As you all know, a supply chain is not just your company, but it's the suppliers to your company, as well as also your customers, of course. But there's tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers. And all of that is obviously essential and important to describe and discuss as we, as we go through this uh, overall collaboratory. Uh, so we're going to outline that. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to describe what actions companies are taking to manage their supply chain and their suppliers. Uh, and you'll hear some great examples from very uh, important companies around the world. And please be prepared to share yours as well as we, as we go through. And the third objective is to develop some recommendations. Now, clearly we're not gonna solve all the world's problems for supply chain today, but we will hopefully come up with some ideas for what you can do to make uh, your supply chain even better than it is today and perform at a higher level so that your customers can be uh, happy and uh, you can uh, meet your financial mission and keep uh, keep your suppliers uh, keep your supply chain intact as as we go through this. So those are the three objectives: outline, describe, and develop. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So here's the agenda we have. So I'm going to be done in just a couple of minutes here. Uh, I'm going to describe some of our observations that we have as we work with companies around the world. Uh, I'm going to turn it over next to uh, uh, two of our partners from uh, Bain, who are you know outstanding consulting firm. Uh, very involved with supply chain and operations around the world and uh, very engaged with helping companies uh, deal with the impact of the coronavirus. So they'll have a, uh, a 10 minute slot to talk about that, a very high level discussion, uh, but very insightful. Uh, we'll then turn it over to Saga. And uh, if you haven't heard of Saga, Saga is uh, a leading uh, IT firm uh, in Central Europe, actually headquartered in Belgrade. So you'll hear from the CEO of that company telling you about uh, what they're doing and some of the exciting work they've done from a technology perspective as well. Um, after Saga, we have lucky enough to have Juniper Networks from India. Uh, and uh, Harsh is gonna give you a great description of what's happening with Juniper Networks, how they're coping with the coronavirus, what's happening in India, and how uh, they, they are looking forward. Now we've tried to leave as much time as possible at the end of the meeting for a discussion and Q&A. So uh, at about 9.40, uh, we're gonna start the Q&A process We'll have your questions, we'll answer them, we'll discuss them. Um, uh, I'll come back and wrap up at uh, uh, 9.55 a.m. This is all New York time, of course. And we'll end our discussion at, uh, at 10 a.m. So we'll respect your time and make sure we stay right on, uh, right on track. So that's our plan for today. Next, uh, next slide, please. Quick, quick briefing on what some companies are doing. You know that companies are really working their supplier networks. I'm sure all of you are doing the same thing. First of all, they're trying to decide what is the new demand plan and what is needed and, and when. And there's a lot of uncertainty about this for many companies. And uh, uh, people aren't sure when will the uh, impact of COVID-19 uh, diminish? When will we have a market where people are out and buying things that we should be developing for? Of course, there's a lead time around this, so you have to start your supply chain in action full time, getting things done so you'll be ready for that, that chance. Um, how do I make sure I don't pay for things I don't need? And, uh, do I need to change my supplier contracts? Uh, a lot of issues that companies are dealing with around this. Uh, and mostly making sure that their contracts that they have are honored by their suppliers to the extent that they can be. So a lot of discussion about that going on. How do I make sure that I'm not out of stock or late on things that I can sell? Uh, it's, uh, many companies have a, a problem where things that customers want to buy are not available because their supply chain isn't able to produce them because the tier one supplier or the tier two supplier didn't have the stock and couldn't provide it to the next stage in the chain. How do I make sure that suppliers prioritize my company? Uh, believe me, this is happening right now. Uh, our members and companies around the world are talking to their suppliers and trying to make sure that their company needs are met, that what they have uh, is available for their customers so they can make their customers happy. Um, in addition, there's some prioritization of customer segments. You know, if we have a shortage, if there's a million other things that we can produce, we want to make sure we give them to the most important customers that we have. So that's going on right now. How do I uh, decide how to price this? Do I, how do I avoid paying more even though there's short supply? Uh, how can I in fact pay less in, in certain instances? Then in general, how should I restructure my supplier network? So those are all happening right now, real time as, as we talk through a variety of things, including uh, war rooms that are being set up.
Uh, next slide, please. Um, and their supplier issues abound. I don't want to take any more time about this since you, you know all about this as well as I do, probably better than I do, around all the companies around the world, what they're doing to work their supply chains to uh, make things work better and to have the supplier network uh, actually deliver things that their customers can use. Uh, next, next slide, please. So what are the actions that companies are taking uh, in the short term? Uh, companies are doing an inventory of their tier one, tier two, and tier three suppliers, their location, their work process, what threats they have, and how they look in terms of ability to supply what's needed. Uh, the second thing they're doing is they're doing a big assessment process uh, of the supply chain and looking at past and current requirements. Uh, you know, what we sold last year is not a great guide for what we're gonna sell this year. What we produced last year is not what we're gonna produce this year, so let's have an assessment of what really needs to happen. Third, there's a discussion going on about uh, with all the suppliers and negotiating favorable terms, uh, despite the fact that the suppliers uh, in many cases have conflicting demands for what they're doing. Uh, the fourth thing is a shift uh, around how you actually modify your logistics and delivery to accommodate all the travel constraints that exist around the world. How do you make things get to the customer or get to your distributor? Uh, we're talking B2B or B2C uh, as, as we go through this process. Uh, next, commit. Uh, we've got to make sure we modify our supplier scoreboard, uh, make sure we understand what suppliers we want to continue using and work forward. And then finally, measure. We are big, big believers in measurement. Uh, a lot of new measures should be developed uh, for suppliers and uh, particularly in this time of crisis. Those are the things that are happening right now. And my final slide is the next slide, which is all about what happens in the midterm. So as we're doing that, uh, we've got to really assess our current supplier network decide what companies we're going to work with in the future, and decide what we're going to do in-house and also outsource. Uh, we secondly we want to make sure we encourage suppliers to use more automated production facilities that are you know, driven by technology like AI and 3D. Uh, a big push will happen on this as we go through the midterm. Uh, decide how to close to the customer you can get. So a lot of people are now saying, look, we need to take our supply chain and move it closer to the customer in some elements. That's very, very possible. And finally, create a, craft a long-term plan for your supplier base that creates lower costs, higher value, and uh, minimizes the risk you face, uh, because for sure, this is not gonna be the only uh, major dilemma that we face for the next few years. So these things are happening now. So this, I've used up my time, and I'm gonna turn now over to my, uh, my partners from uh, Bain. So uh, Bain, will you please uh, uh, take over, and I'll put myself on mute. Great. Um... Hi everyone, um, this is David Shannon, uh, partner at Bain & Company. Um, I work in our uh, office in Silicon Valley and I lead our procurement practice in the Americas. Um, and I wanna talk to you a little bit of today about what, um, what we're doing with, with some of our clients and what we're seeing our clients do uh, as it relates to um, uh, the securing their supply base and uh, protecting their operations in this crisis. Um, so if you flip to the next page, um, so we're working, we're working on a whole range of, um, of aspects of COVID response with, with clients and, uh, stabilizing operations is one big pillar of what clients are, what our clients are, um, are focused on today. And this is our operations playbook, um, for COVID response. And you can see there's a number of elements to this playbook. Actually, the, the, the middle of the page here is really focused on what we call our act now playbook. So these are um, uh, very real issues right now that require um, a whole set of actions across um, the disrupted supply base um, operations uh, and, and demand uncertainty. And at the bottom um, is what we call our plan now playbook, which is thinking ahead to um, the recovery and the post COVID world and how can, what are the things you can start planning now to set yourself up for uh, for success in um, when when this crisis uh, when we come out of this crisis, um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, focus on the supply based disruption, um, but I just wanted to kind of share that broader landscape of the of the playbook um, as uh, as all of these aspects are things that the companies are thinking about um, and are very real. So if you flip to the next page. There's a set of um, issues that and themes that um, that are really important in in this time of crisis um, as it relates to your supply base. Um, 
the first of those is has to do with having very clearly defined priorities. Um, as you all are facing um, at the moment, there is an incredibly high amount of activity and um, and work that needs to happen uh, in in terms of uh, supply based disruptions and and securing supply. Um, literally every one of your suppliers need we need to think about uh, and evaluate um, and not just your suppliers but also the suppliers to your suppliers um, and you know upstream all of the upstream uh, s source of supply and of course all the downstream complexity as well and so um, you, you know we're, this is also a time where your people are um, less productive uh, working from home, um, in many cases have had to take on second jobs as caregivers to their children. Um, and so we're facing a, a period of time where we've got a whole, an incredible amount of work that needs to happen and much less productive workforce that needs to do it. And so having a very clearly defined set of priorities is really important and racking and stacking what's the most critical thing that I need to be working on now. Um, secondly, visibility is incredibly important. Um, you need to know, you know, not only where are critical materials in your supply chain, but you also need to know, um, you know, where, from a market intelligence standpoint, where are the, um, which are the markets and suppliers that are most at risk, um, you know, where are their suppliers at risk, where are the critical materials that, um, that are that are at risk, and so um, having having that visibility at your fingertips, we don't have time to um, you know spend months to go out and build the fact base. We we need that at our fingertips now, um, and so the data availability and the systems are really important. Now, companies that have um, invested in building out their um, you know digital procurement systems uh, in the past few years have benefited a lot from that, and other companies that are maybe a bit um, behind. Uh, from a digitization standpoint um, are are suffering a bit more and so um, these are these are really uh, critical things at the moment given given what's happening in real time um, the the fourth point on here is about agility um, and having a, a real ability to redirect operations as needed so companies that have done a nice job of multi-sourcing um, are in a much better position than companies that are single sourced on on many critical uh, components um, communication at the moment is at a premium, uh, given how much complexity there is and how all these different puzzle pieces fit together, it's, and, and how, um, how fast things are changing day by day, it's really important that you've got um, good lines of communication so that changes on one aspect of the supply chain are going to, um, you know, you're, you're able to, to coordinate and communicate with other, other stakeholders. Um, and then the last point on here is that it's very hard to manage in a crisis um, while also running the, you know, aspects of your core business. And so our recommendation to our clients is always that you dedicate um, folks uh, fully to uh, certain individuals fully to crisis management and don't ask people to both deal with uh, emerging crises day to day and also um, uh, try to run their run their day jobs um, and, a, and a corollary to this is we also um, think it's important to um, split resources um, folks that are dealing with um, immediate or act now crises um, uh, from folks that are thinking about planning for the future uh, because the, uh, the the fire drills that folks have to deal with now are always going to take precedent and you'll never end up having time to to plan for the future so we, we suggest having two sets of resources that are that are focused on act now uh, versus plan now. Um, if you flip to the next page, um, just wanted to share kind of our three, um, three go-dos uh, here for that we are advising clients on. Um, first is uh, you need to have a, a clear understanding of, of where you're exposed in your supply base. Um, and so uh, this is looking at um, your suppliers, um, you know, where are your most critical components, where are the areas where you're um, either um, single sourced or uh, where your supply base is in um, geographies that are heavily affected uh, by, by the COVID situation. Um, you also need to um, uh, understand where are their uh, inputs, raw inputs into your supply base that are heavily affected. Um, 
and build out that fact base um, as soon as possible because that's going to be a critical um, a critical component for you to be able to make quick decision and quick action. Uh, in, in the middle, um, of course, analyze that and, and prioritize. Um, and so if you don't already have it, put in place a um, reporting and tracking mechanism. Um, this could be as simple as, a, as an Excel spreadsheet, um, uh, but you really need to have, given how many initiatives, hundreds of initiatives are happening at the moment and how quickly things are changing day by day, you need to have that visibility into, um, into what's happening. Um, you know, many companies are, uh, are, are, are doing, um, you know, daily huddles um, or, uh, or, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, get together. You, you're going to need, um, you're going to need visibility into what's happening and, um, and rapid collaboration. And, um, and then, of course, do a prioritization. You want to make sure you're focused on the most important things um, and not wasting your precious, precious resource on activity that is, um, that is less, uh, less important at the moment. And then on the right-hand side, of course, there's a set of ac actions and activities um, that need to happen. Um, you know, what can you do to actually change, uh, change things and make sure that you're, you know, you're securing supply and getting it to the right place at the right time. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, that's where the focus is really going to be. It's um, getting on the phone, talking to suppliers, talking to customers, making sure that you're having critical materials in the right place at the right time. Um, so I know that was quick, um, just a bit of an overview of, of the, the playbook that, um, that we're working with, with our clients on. And then I'm going to um, have my colleague Ryan Fisher um, talk quickly about some of the resources that um, we, we've made available to our um, clients and, and all of you um, on uh, what's happening in the, in, the, in the COVID crisis. Thanks, David. Ryan Fisher here, partner with Bain. As David mentioned, we've put together a virtual war room. As you all know, things are changing quickly, happening quickly around the world and, and you know, with COVID-19, with impacts to businesses. And, and we've, we're putting a lot of thoughts and insight together of, of how to react and, and what to do. I want to provide those resources to you and, and references as, as you go, go about your business. And so there's, there's a few pieces that, that are available uh, within this war room. The, the first is the, the overall economic impact and implications of COVID-19 across different geographies and across, across the business. We're, we're tracking that and, and putting a, a scale together here in the index of, of how this moves around in different places of the world and what it means to, to businesses in that area. The second is in the middle there, which is war rooms. As we're all setting up war rooms and overall war rooms, supply chain war rooms, of how, what are the, the right ways to think about that? And, and what are the important pieces to have in a war room? What are the plans? What are the actions? Um, what are the, the, the important um, pieces of supply chain and supply base that David just went through, how you actually need to think about that. We've got some content there of, of, that I really think can help facilitate uh, some of your war room actions. And then thirdly is <clears throat> we've been putting a lot of thought together on both the industry and function specific playbooks. So you're looking across consumer and retail, looking across chemicals, looking across uh, mobile phones, looking across different sectors and those supply chains and how how you should think about addressing those specifically and what are some of the implications and, and playbooks to be able to to address some of the some of the risks that happen there so you know please reference these materials hope they're very helpful to you uh, the the it's at our website it's bain.com slash insights slash topics slash coronavirus thank you george back to you yeah thank you Thank you, uh, Ryan. Thank you, David. A great, great discussion. And I think this is a, a resource that uh, the companies on this call ought to take advantage of. So go, go look at the website and get some, get some tips on how, that, uh, how you can improve your performance. And now we're going to quickly roll to the CEO of Saga. He'll tell you a little bit about his company and about what they're doing. So please, uh, please take over. Um, I hope you all hear me. Yes, we hear you great. So no, thank you. Hi from Belgrade, um, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present some of the stuff that we are doing. Uh, let us just start by putting us where we are in supply chain. We are generally the guy next to the customer, so towards the end of it, because uh, we uh, tend to integrate a lot of IT equipment and add some of our own solutions. 
And um, my idea today is to present to you some of the, let's say, challenges, but also solutions that we um, you know, presented to our customers and uh, how we behave. Um, just for the reference, it's about a month uh, since in Serbia or this part of the Europe, we had first cases and it's about third week of, um, let's say, uh, highest, uh, higher level of restrictions in terms of movement of the people as a response of the government toward the control of this whole situation. So this is putting a lot of strain on, on everyone uh, from, from society, from social point of view, but of course, from economical point of view. So if you show me the first slide, uh, we, so this is Belgrade just for you, and then, okay, so next slide, please. Um, so uh, in, in, we had to start from very beginning, uh, thinking about our, our own people, but also thinking about our customers, because as you can imagine, uh, as someone who has to go to the customer site, who has to still move, even though a lot of people uh, are, are trying to be as socially distant as possible, it's a challenge. So we had uh, written a whole playbook about behavior of our own employees, but also behavior of the management that is setting up the customer calls. Um, and it, it goes in, into great details, as you see some of the examples here. Uh, it, and we try to make it in a way that both our customer and our employees feel comfortable about you know, going around and, and doing what we need to do. And um, as you can imagine, uh, there was a huge shift from you know, working in the offices to uh, home office. And some of the in, for some of the industries, uh, this uh, proves to be a, a great challenge. And um, uh, for us as a supplier, it was a matter of how we decide how quickly react and how we give uh, priorities. In the end, you know, it, it, what we decide as a management in the company is that as long we can help any customer at any point with any request, we're gonna go along and, and, and redo it. Uh, I know it doesn't sound very economical, but the, you know, this situation is where we are trying to you know, help any way possible all our customers. So if you could show me the next slide, I took an example of the financial industry. And you can imagine that for years, we've been building together with the customers from the financial industry, especially banks, these fortresses in terms of security, all their online presence of all the tools that they're exposing there to be very sturdy and very secure. And usually they were very centralized to their own buildings, to their own data centers. Suddenly, all these guys came to us uh, in like Thursday evening, Friday morning saying, next Monday, we need to be start working from home. All our guys need to be out of our buildings and we need to uh, keep the level of services. So from migrating the call centers uh, to uh, extending VPN connections to people's homes to completely setting up a new PCs, uh, PCs from home uh, to, and to make sure that you know, they are secure to, to, uh, to get in touch with the core banking systems and very, very sensitive uh, banking uh, installations we had to do. And pretty much it was for us work that was really almost not contracted because at this point we just uh, said, okay, these are the guys we've been working for for years and it's not a time to, to go into contracts or, or, or pricing, but let's get these guys rolling and then we'll see what comes next. And um, this is just the example uh, of, of what we did in, in, in one industry, but with the prevailing thought was uh, whoever we cooperated for years, we get these guys set and going and we don't you know, ask uh, for anything additional or, or make any you know, request in terms of procurement or, or anything similar because the, the logic was we need to keep everybody afloat and, and get things going. And then the next slide um, is the example uh, that we are hope to, to get actually today going. Uh, as you can imagine, um, when you start closing the society and the, the number of hours that people can move gets restricted, uh, government needs some ways of uh, issuing permits to businesses to, to move around. And um, initially they tried something very crude where people were applying to uh, responsible ministries uh, for, for permits for their employees to move around. Uh, turns out very inefficient. Uh, the, process, the, the requests were not, you know, not processed, especially not in timely manner. 
So we went along and pretty much donated um, application for approval of uh, permits uh, during a curfew. And uh, it's kind of funny because uh, we talk a lot about digital, uh, digital and, and uh, digital transformation, but Corona is kind of turning as a killer app for a lot of government businesses, where actually a lot of stuff that was built or that was in preparation now is rushing toward, uh, toward the businesses in, in their digital form because uh, no other form is uh, available. And uh, the last point I wanna uh, tell you about, uh, if you'll show me the next slide, is actually something that we did uh, about a week ago, and we are um, quite uh, proud of this. So um, as, as this thing erupted, a lot of people had a really lot of questions, and, and government was trying to set up the call centers to respond to, to all the questions, but uh, you know, it was very difficult to keep these lines open and, and to kind of calm the, the society to, to, to give the available answers from you know, health questions to questions about government measures. And since we are the company that for the last three years did a lot of work in the area of artificial intelligence and, and making of the chatbots, we figured out uh, we are going to donate a, a chatbot uh, to, to a government. And uh, together with the office of a prime minister uh, in four days, which we thought was impossible just you know, a month ago, uh, we created about 80 scenarios uh, that uh, cover various topics from how some instructions of how daily life uh, functions to instructions to certain groups such as uh, you know uh, pregnant women to uh, uh, instructions how to wash your hands uh, uh, very useful tips that in general uh, people would go around looking uh, to to ask uh, we did it in a, in a form of, of a chatbot where you can type your question and, and then you get the the, the answer. And uh, we're really proud to say that uh, in a country of, you know, barely 7 million people, we have about uh, 200,000 followers. But what is even more important, we have about 3 million exchanges. And the way we perceive this is this, these 3 million exchanges would be some millions of calls to call centers uh, that will not be able to, you know, they, they will, wouldn't be able to handle this. And, uh, you know, level of anxiety would go up. So. This is something that uh, you know it's functioning now in, in Serbia for about a week, and it's showing a, a great uh, level of usage. Uh, Viber is a messaging platform that dominantly is used in Serbia, so we cooperate with these guys, and um, you know this is actually being quite used on, on a daily level, and we are very proud of it. But besides the, the the prime minister office, the Institute of Health started giving us uh, scenarios to add, so now it's getting even smarter. And, uh, you know, this is being kind of positive thing in, in this whole turmoil of what's been going on and uh, something that to, to make us feel good. So something that I wanted to, to share uh, on, on this call. So this is, let's say in a few words, chip in from, from our side, how we treat the, the situation in the supply chain but also what we did uh, for, for society in a sense of how we used our knowledge to implement some of the solutions uh, that would be useful for, uh, for this moment and, and hopefully relevant to the customer, but also to the wi wider uh, elements of society. So th that much for me. Great, hey, thank you very much. That was a great uh, discussion. And uh, uh, I wanna say something about Serbia. We gave our, we had our, uh, our first meeting there a little while ago. Uh, in Belgrade, and it was fabulous. And uh, I, I, I left feeling so impressed with uh, the country and especially the uh, level of uh, uh, digital literacy. And one thing I'll share with the group is that, you know, in fourth grade, uh, all kids in uh, Serbia learned, learned to use uh, Python, the, the analytics software. So they really are building a very digitally literate community. And uh, I think the work you did to, in response to the coronavirus is really, really interesting and, and helpful. And I, I should mention, so many of you on the call have, have uh, said a chat to me asking if there's going to be, uh, this is going to be available after our session. And it will be. We'll send you uh, a copy <clears throat> and, a, and a link so that you can always uh, uh, show this uh, presentation, these discussions to other people in your organization. Uh, but right now I want to shift gears and move uh, right away to India. India is an amazing country with incredible uh, importance in the supply chain. 
and I'd like to talk about, I'd like to have the Juniper Networks uh, director please um, uh, speak up on what's happening there, and everybody knows Juniper Networks, <clears throat> I think, a worldwide firm, uh, but, but please go ahead and tell us about what you're doing in India. Yeah, sure. Thanks, George. Uh, am I audible? Just wanted to do a check and then maybe I can start. Yes, you sound great. You sound clear. Perfect. Right. So, you know, just for everybody's benefit, uh, you know, Juniper Networks, uh, we are a network gear manufacturing company uh, and uh, it's a global company headquartered in uh, US and well. And uh, I am part of the India team and I manage the partner business here. And by the way, 100% of our business happens to partners. With, so virtually, I manage all the business. Uh, uh, what is happening? So I'm going to be sharing with you, uh, you know, more on what's happening and how we are responding, you know, to customers uh, more from the supply chain and, you know, support kind of a, uh, initiative. Uh, as I shared earlier, uh, Juniper, since we manufacture networking gear, and then there are a lot of our partners, who help them put together, uh, you know, and provide the solutions to our various customers. Our customers, by the way, are all the B2B customers. You know, we don't have anything where we sell to end customers as such directly, right? So it is all about, uh, you know, the telcos, the internet service providers, various government organizations, government projects, lot of enterprise customers, and so on and so forth, right? So what, what we have done, uh, you know, when the Corona, uh, you know, crisis strike is that uh, we decided that it is time to go and, you know, support our customers and, uh, you know, increase the intimacy from both ways. You know, one is we want to see our customers succeed and that's the only way we can also succeed. But we thought, uh, you know, this is going to help us in the long run. Uh, you know, to, because we had the sales angle also, you know, all the time, uh, you know, whenever we talk to the customers. Uh, so first thing what we did in response is that uh, all our healthcare customers, uh, irrespective of whether, you know, they have their uh, support uh, contracts on or not on, you know, because sometimes customers don't, uh, you know, don't renew their contracts. So we have opened support to all the customers, all our healthcare customers irrespective of their uh, contracts on or not. And then what we have done is, you know, that we worked with, uh, you know, the governments here uh, because the work from home situation, you know, has uh, put unprecedented traffic on the network and all our customers in the telco and the IS internet service provider space, uh, they have seen unprecedented traffics uh, to an extent that uh, you know, there was a risk of something failing down and that could have really created more havoc in the system, right? So what we have done is, uh, you know, we ensured that we build redundancy in all the networks. We provide 24 power you know, support to all of them in case of, you know, any kind of a failure or so. And at the same time, there was a support services on for them to guide through, uh, you know, how to change traffic from, one network to other and so on and so forth. For example, you know, while the work from home network traffic has increased, but maybe somewhere else, let's say the universities are closed because India is facing a lockdown, complete lockdown for uh, 21 days. Some states are facing it for even more than that, you know, 25 to 27 days. So uh, all the offices, you know, be the government offices or, you know, universities, schools, everything is closed, right? So there was some bandwidth which was freed on that end. So we helped our customers to kind of navigate that to ensure that the networks are, are running. Uh, we believe, you know, that big crises are big opportunities as well, right? And this is the time, uh, you know, supply chain or timely supply is actually going to become a differentiator also for, for our, you know, when, when you try and go and sell to the customer. And it's, it's a good thing, you know, more, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, supporting the society. So that is also one of the thoughts behind, uh, you know, why Juniper is doing the way we are doing. Uh, you know, so I think so that's largely about, uh, you know, what we are trying to do here. Uh, we are working with the governments to, uh, to get, uh, you know, permits in terms of uh, uh, 
uh, you know some of these are to be classified as the essential uh, supplies you know because as you know in curfews and lockdowns uh, what is allowed is only the essential supplies uh, so so we have been able to convince the government and you know as as i speak with you a couple of days back we could uh, secure some of those permits by which our shipments are getting cleared you know and as we speak they are actually going to all the mission critical Uh, customer locations at this point of time uh, you know so i think those are few things that uh, we are doing and uh, back to you george you know i thought i want to share with you more live examples how we are trying to cater to these things that's great thank you i mean juniper networks is a great company and the work you're doing in india is amazing and especially important to understand how it's impacting the overall uh, network and uh, so very good very interesting and we have another uh, uh, person leader from india as well on the phone and uh, DS, do you have a few words you could you could uh, share with us about what's happening uh, in that part of the world? Yeah, uh, George, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting us on this call. Uh, like Harsh was explaining, you know, it's very unprecedented. We are facing huge crisis in sort of supply chain, uh, while government is very focused on essentials. You know, businesses are down, stocks are down. and it, uh, you know uh, we really don't know what would happen in terms of the next uh, few days i mean if a recession is setting uh, government is trying to bail out some of the you know daily bail out packages helping citizens with uh, uh, incentives and so on and so forth especially for the you know we have a large labor force you know in india you know with uh, supply chains uh, employ a large labor force and uh, their movement is restricted and so the only way in which we can communicate we can do is the digital uh, process and so a lot of effort is being done uh, by companies like dinpur networks to strengthen the digital networks and uh, we must wait and see yes there are uh, some short term and mid term actions taken by the uh, organizations also government to ease the situation uh, but you know uh, india is a huge country and uh, you know we have a, a lot of interest we have a lot of states you know 29 states in the country and then uh, you know we have a huge challenge we see uh, especially in moving things and uh, some of people who i talk to they share that you know their depots are closed and they are not able to transport you know these are the infrastructure challenges are there so supply chain to that extent is uh, really uh, in a in a very very difficult position like harsh was saying uh, the organizations are coming forward to overcome situation at the same time trying to help the people in the government you know uh, people and the people safety and health is seems to be the most uh, priority item as of now well thank yeah thank thank you for that that's uh, uh everyone's watching what india does and uh sure that uh, the the you'll do well with the corona virus crisis um well that's super so all of our panelists have completed their discussion i as i mentioned before you will get a uh a copy of their remarks and uh, you, there's going to be a live video available as well for this uh for this session should you want to share it um but i'd like now to uh, uh have some discussion going and i i realize there's one there's several parts of the world that have not yet spoken uh one area we've we've done some work in is uh is uh, uh latin america and uh uh on i think andres you're on the phone if i'm right uh, could you Could you comment on what what you see happening and what you recommend from from your perspective? Uh, you're based in Chile and uh, in Santiago. So, any any comments from you or or your team? Um, what we are doing is to try to mix, um, to try to hyper segment the country. That means that we are treating every region as an independent country because as what is happening in Chile at least. the country is, is the, the the level of contagious people or the city are different because of that we are the authorities are trying to make different uh, policies around the cities that means that we are management the supply chain between that policies on that and the other thing is we are trying to contain the most important industries in the country to maintain the gdp on that secondly uh, the entire country is moved completely to digitalize in every aspect uh, about everything we need about science about documents about logistic about everything and the third thing is we are using a lot of ai to try to make the forecast what is going to happen because we are seeing that for humans this kind of uh, scenarios is so difficult to analyze 
because you need to put around 500 different um, outside, if you want, indicators from the, uh, the, global, the global economy. That means the AI is trying to make more accuracy forecast and recovery uh, all the, the different industries better because they're committing less mistake than humans on that forecast. That helps, George, or not? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I understand uh, the challenges uh, are really worldwide, and uh, Latin America, of course, has uh, has to deal with the coronavirus as well. And I'd like to now um, uh, find out about other questions that people have uh, from for the panelists or for the Digital Supply Chain Institute. So uh, uh, please type in your questions, or uh, or go ahead and ask your questions live if you have uh, if you have that capability. Uh, who else has some? Uh, uh, some questions they want to ask right now. All right, while you're thinking of that, I'm going to call on one of the people here. I know is one of our members, uh, a great company named Janice, uh, Brian Simp. Brian, will you, will you, what, what's going on from, that you see as you work with companies uh, uh, across the world? You know, George, we're seeing the same things that have been discussed here. There's some disruption and now ramp up coming out of Asia. Um, the United States is now on lockdown for the most part from coast to coast. So there's a lot of restriction around movement and even what businesses are allowed to be open. Uh, so if you're not on the, the essential list, it's really tough to, to explain, you know, depending on where you're operating. Um, one of the questions that I that I had for maybe the panelists here is, is really around some of the funding opportunities that are out there to help with the disruption. So at least in the United States, there's a lot of stimulus discussion. It's a little nebulous for me and other businesses that are out there being affected. And does anybody have any guidance around how to access some of those resources or any advice as to what's available to supply chains that are in fact being affected by by the current circumstance. So I'm not sure which one of our panelists can answer that, but uh, Brian's asking a good question. And uh, I'm wondering, I don't know, uh, one of our partners from Bain perhaps has an answer to that, or uh, uh, I'm not sure who, who, who could provide some guidance for, uh, for Brian on that, on that good question you asked. George, let me. Uh, this is David Shannon from Bain. Um, let me just say a couple of thoughts. I, I don't. I don't. Ex I don't have a perfect answer to that specific question. But one thing that um, uh, our clients, a lot of our clients, are facing is um, cash and liquidity issues at the moment. Right? Um, they have uh, big fixed cost bases, um, and yet their demand is is, uh, is is dropping massively. And um, clearly, you know, their cash positions. Uh, many companies cash positions are, are not set up for <laughs> what we're dealing with now. Um, and so um, one thing that a lot of companies are, are really starting to do is, is have a dedicated stream on cash management um, and, and think about um, what, are, what can they be doing at the moment to preserve cash um, to keep them afloat over the next coming months um, as this all plays out. And so, um, you know, really looking at every, every dollar of spend that happens today um, and figuring out, okay, where can we um, stop cash from going out the door? Where can we freeze um, activity that is is non-critical, non-essential? Um, how can we work with our supply uh, supply base to um, extend payment terms where uh, where needed and push out investments um, where um, you know a lot of IT investments that had been planned are, are getting pushed out? And so um, that typically requires a, a pretty extensive exercise and a dedicated team to, to focus on that. Um, but it's really critical at the moment as companies are, are trying to stay afloat. Yeah, I agree. You're totally right about that. I, I, do, I do think there's that Brian's asking a different kind of different question uh, about how to get ac how to get access to some of the other uh, assistance. So we we'll, we'll take that offline and we'll uh, we'll do a little bit of work research on that and get back to the uh, at least in the US what people people can can do. Um, Let's get some more uh, more questions here. I think Hafimi, uh, you you raised your hand. Do you have a question you want to ask the uh, panelists or make a comment? Uh, yes, uh, maybe just a question to the panelists. Thanks, George. Um, I, I live in a small country called Brunei in Southeast Asia, um, and I was just wondering. And I sent this uh, this question actually to George. Um, in in the in the whole overview of where corporations are looking at their future 
re realignment on supply chains. Um, where is the thinking in trying to bring in the SME into sort of like a cluster base to support more larger companies, especially from a geographical perspective? Because you already have the playbooks for it in terms of how to actually set up your supply chain. But is that something that you would consider retooling, reskilling, or you know, even franchising the way the operations would work to get them closer to your customer, especially on a on on a future thinking level. Just, it's just a it's just an open question. Um, I don't expect any answers, but just planting a seed of thought there. Thanks, George. Yeah, thank you. That that is a good question. I think uh, one theme that probably all the panelists would agree with me on is that. Uh, as people look at their supply chain now with laser focus on how we're going to make this work right now, they're also thinking about, and let's think about where we're going to go from here. Um, what, 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 what's going to be the groundwork that we lay for a more agile, flexible, uh, close to the customer supply chain? Uh, and it's going to have a very different architecture than what we have today. So in some ways, uh, it's good that we're having this discussion now. I wish it weren't about under COVID, but uh, it's great that we're having this discussion because it's, it's uh, the way people change their supply chain going forward will be will be quite uh, different. I have a question from uh, uh, Jim Newkirk, who's uh, from Colgate Palmolive, uh, a great member company of ours. It's about uh, what are people seeing as far as bonuses or hazard pay for employees they are still working um, or, or, or 3PL. So uh, anybody have observations about that? What happens with uh, uh, bonuses and hazard pay for, uh, for employees? Any, any observations about that? I personally haven't, uh, uh, haven't seen I haven't. I don't have a lot of experience to answer that question. And who else has a, some experience that would be relevant to, to, to Jim's question? If if nobody has any guidance for you, Jim, we'll put that on list. We'll go do some research about it. I don't. I don't. I don't have a quick answer. Uh, if I if I may jump in, Nevisha from from Saga. Uh, yes. We were we were thinking about that a lot because uh, we, as I said, we have people who have to be out there and, and, and kind of take additional risk compared to the guys we can stash at home. And we did make some financial provision for these guys because in the end, they we are all aware that the reality is that they may, may end up on sick leave. So, you know, we need to give them some compensation now as opposed to later. So we were thinking uh, of that and the guys who are moving around and taking additional risk we are giving some, you, first time I heard of it, but it, it's a good name, hazard bonus. The, so in, in that sense, I think that that, need, that needs to be considered and that kind of gives uh, additional, let's say, courage to the people. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think that for sure there are frontline people who are, uh, do face more hazards because they're the front line and they're going to uh, potentially receive some hazard pay or some other way of, of uh, compensating them for their, for their work. But uh, we'll have to do some more research on that. And uh, Thomas Jenden has a question about uh, what happens to structural changes with the supply chain. I think uh, I, probably all the panelists would agree with me on this, that uh, um, there will be some real changes to how the supply chains are set up around the world. Not just because, oh, we wanna have less things in China, but because we wanna have a agile supply chain with things that can migrate from uh, from place to place as as the supply and demand changes. Um, and, uh, you know, this idea about uh, uh, just-in-time inventory, that's good. But, you know, one of the things that we really see happening is this new data model that people are creating uh, that allows them to better forecast customer needs and shape them. And, uh, and then using algorithms to sort of hardwire that information into decision-making. So if you have a new data model, for example, you have data from social media, you have data from sensors, you have data from IoT devices, uh, and it's across industries. This is B2B and B2C. If you have that data uh, and you have an algorithm that allows you to say, okay, if these things happen, here's the move we need to make in our supply chain. Uh, you've got a much more robust, uh, much more active digital supply chain. And that's, that's going to be something that happens uh, uh, with, with leading companies really around the world for, for sure. Um, we have time for uh, one more question. Who else has a question that they'd like to, uh, they'd like to ask? George, I'm waiting on a question. Ryan Fisher here. I, I, with Bain, I just comment on on that last question. I I completely agree with you. Where you know the question was around how do you think about supply chains changing after this? 
you know, supply chains will change, but it's not, not necessarily the underlying, you know, value chain or supply chain. I think what changes is how do you rapidly react to these extreme demand changes? And you're exactly right. And it's, it's how you feed the data and have a new data model to identify those early demand indicators that allow you to have a, a structure to completely change your replenishment algorithms, your, you know, how you, how you, you use your supply base and move across your supply base. That, that's what's going to be the focus uh, coming out of this is how do you, how do you quickly react? It's not necessarily fundamentally change the supply chain. It's about the, the rapid reaction. Yep. I agree. I agree. By the way, there's another question that uh, anonymous attendee asked. It says, uh, uh, do you advise companies to prepare top management position succession plan? in large companies and uh, you know the answer is of course you're right they should we should there should be succession plans uh for all these positions and one thing i will i will add and i, I this is my prediction my prediction is that uh more and more ceo positions in major companies around the world will be staffed with people who have supply chain experience because the supply chain now is the core business process uh without the supply chain there's nothing to sell so you have to it would be to be or ask to work uh and the operational awareness that it takes to run one well is, is really, really important. Plus, uh, as, 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 you know, as an institute, we've done a lot of work on this, uh, turning your supply chain into something that not only reduces costs and not only provides continuity, but also generates revenue. That's a really powerful idea that some companies are really working hard on. How can you make your supply chain so attractive that you can do what we call a front side flip? You can actually take the supply chain and face the customer and create more demand. Uh, that's that, that's that is a model that companies are going towards, and, and will continue to go to as as we get through the coronavirus crisis. So um, uh, the the questions and answers have been great. I'm going to ask my panelists if they have anything to to uh, say, and then if uh, if not, I'm going to close the call. So uh, uh, panelists from 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 Saga or from from uh, Juniper Networks or from uh, Bain, any anybody have any closing comments, or or should we wrap the call up? Yeah, hi, this is Harsh. My only closing comment, and I completely agree with you, and you know, I also mentioned it, is that supply chain will be a differentiator. Probably it never was so much earlier, but I think this crisis will make it to the forefront and it, it will be a differentiator for companies. Yeah, I agree completely. So what we're going to do now is uh, uh, several things. One is we're going to host another one of these meetings. Uh, in a couple of weeks and it'll be again about the supply chain it'll talk about uh it'll have a worldview so it won't just be us or just europe or just asia it will have a worldview um and uh it will also um focus on a specific topic uh we, you know this one was more on suppliers but of course the whole story but but also suppliers the next one will have a specific focus but the, but also give you some context so we'll do another one of these you'll all be invited again thank you for participating we'll provide you with uh, uh, the ability to get a copy of this material and access the information as well as a uh, uh, a copy of the actually the, a videotape of what, what what happened today but i'd like to thank uh, all of my panelists for participating you all did a fabulous job great insights and uh, and great knowledge that you shared with everyone everybody here i'm, I'm sure really appreciates it i know that i do and uh, uh, i also thank you to all the attendees who joined the call ask good questions we'll answer your questions when we, we send out a an email to wrap up the meeting, but uh, uh, we want to respect your time. It's uh, at the top of the hour. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. We'll send you the information and we'll uh, we look forward to talking to you again in, uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. So thanks very much and uh, cheers for now. Thank, thank you so much. Bye now. <laughs>